He was located to send his wife, yelling at you know, yelling at their armed men outside, and so calling for him, and he responded much the same way anyone else would respond. Um, he grabbed his rifle and stepped in between his family and threat. This is the problem, is that in this country, because we are free, because we do have a right to bear arms, because quite a, many, quite a few of us are well-trained veterans, uh, whether military, police, or just well-trained civilians, we're going to respond the same way he did. Um, of all the men in Oath Keepers, 12,000 some members that were polled, no one disagreed, no one said they would do anything different than what he did. We'd all respond the same way. So he wound up with a perverse situation where the better trained you are, the more likely you are to be shot by SWAT simply for defending your family. I've had some SWAT officers argue um, that somehow this makes doing these entries like this makes people safer because they're coming so it's so willing to force the dynamic entry, flashbangs and all that, people just, you know, freeze up and go, go deer in the headlights. That's my, that might be true for an untrained individual. But a trained individual, you get an ex army ranger, you get a trained marine, you know, you get a guy like me as a paratrooper and a fire instructor, you get a guy like Bill Buford from the Special Forces, a Rivetier, or you get a retired police officer, Sheriff Mack, or one of my police officers in our leadership, Dave Freeman, 30 years Las Vegas Metro bike cop. He's not going to just stand there and freeze. He's going to grab his firearm, he's going to go to work. And the problem is, is that, you know, he's going to work against a bad guy, criminal home invasion, he'll be lauded as a hero. He goes to work against other police officers, he's probably going to die. Or if he survives, he'll be called a cop killer. So, this is the problem. The Fourth Amendment is there for a reason. The founders have lived through warrantless searches. They've lived through officers who claim the authority to come into their doors and through their house when they wanted to. So that's why the Fourth Amendment is there. One of the causes of a revolution was the writs of assistance to explain that a customs officer can just, what they call a general warrant, no requirement of probable cause, and he can just come into the home and whenever he wanted to. And it wasn't just a matter of uh, the fact that there were no, were no uh, probable cause determination by a judge. That's bad enough. And a modern counterpart of the national security letters, the FBI is writing for itself right now. But the other problem was the manner in which the searches were done. The officers would use that power as a tool. There was one case where uh, there was a dispute, and a customs officer was involved in the dispute, and he said, well, I'll show you my power. And he came back with his agents and said, I'm going to show you what I can do, and he came into the house, into the home of these people. So the founders uh, wrote the First Amendment, the Fourth Amendment, to protect us against unreasonable searches and seizures. And of course, as anyone that follows uh, Supreme Court jurisdiction, that our jurisprudence knows, that they've watered down what is reasonable, they've watered down that standard to the point of absurdity. You now have last week's Supreme Court ruling that said that if a police officer knocks on your door and hears what he determines is sound, the potential sound of evidence being destroyed, he can go ahead and kick in the door and come in without a warrant. But the criteria for reasonableness is not just getting a warrant. A lot of folks think that once they have a warrant, after that, they can just come in any way they want to. How they come in makes a big difference. And as I said earlier, I submit that a warrant that is served in such a manner that it results in your death is the epitome of an unreasonable search. And below that, if you're lucky to survive, a, a search method that brings armed agents of the state face to face with armed gun owners and potentially well-trained veterans or former police officers is also unreasonable. Because what you're doing is you're throwing, you're throwing two trained professionals face to face in a dark hallway, in a dark doorway, where the homeowner does not know who this is. They have to assume it's bad guy, criminal home invaders. But while the homeowner is, is trying his best to go through a cycle, an oodle loop cycle of observe, orientate, decide, and act, he's thinking to himself, is this a good guy with a gun or a bad guy with a gun? Problem is, is while he's doing that process, on the other side of the coin, the SWAT officer comes to the door, what's he thinking? Only if he sees men with a gun, threat, he shoots. In his mind, there's no such thing as a good guy with a gun inside that house. Two different moves going, which one's faster? What's, what's going to happen when they collide? What happened here? You had a man who died with a safety on. Now, you might say, well, he was just incompetent. He just forgot to pull the safety off. 
you know, that would be the argument that, well, he obviously was intending to shoot police officers. Well, if that were the case, well, I don't buy that, first of all. In a two-tour two uh, combat vet, well-trained Marine, I think the likely situation was he was in the middle of that oodle loop process trying to decide whether these were good guys or bad guys, and he was doing the responsible thing and had his thumb on his safety. He was writing it, but it was not clicked off. You train safety on, come up, safety off. It's really easy to do. Anybody who knows firearms knows that. So that's what I think happened. He was trying to decide who these people were, and on the other side of the coin, as soon as the SWAT officer saw a rifle raised them, they fired. That's the problem. As I said earlier, we're not here to beat up on the individual officers in the Pima County Sheriff's Department, or even the ones on that SWAT team, with one proviso, lack of medical care. We'll talk about that later. But up front, going through a door like that, and going into a fatal funnel, I can understand when they see, when they see weapon raised them, they're going to fire. The problem is they shouldn't have been there in the first place. And as I said earlier, I've got, a, I've got an uncle here who served 25 years at the Pima County Sheriff's Deputy, Robert Creech. Great guy. I grew up coming down here for the summers. I see him leaving his uniform, started the day, come home after a long day's work. Good man. He thinks this was unreasonable. And he thinks this was unreasonable because what it does is it puts a big bullseye on the head of gun owners. And if you were here right now, I'd have to talk to you. But the uh, point is, though, is we're not here to beat up on the individual officers. There's a systemic problem within law enforcement in this country. And that problem is, is that increasingly, the tactics that are deployed are the same tactics that are deployed overseas in warfare or in counterterrorism operations. And they've let down and they're being deployed across this country. Of 400 raids per day is the estimation. And you can go to Razor Balco's interactive map on the Cato Institute's website. It's a fantastic resource. And you can see multiple examples of individuals being shot. Uh, one example was was a family, it was a, a narcotics, once again, a, a search warrant into a home with a family. The whole family is thrown on the ground with, with weapons pointed back at their heads. One of them was a little 11 year old boy. SWAT officer had a shotgun in the back of his head. The shotgun discharges, blow the little kid's head off. How is that a reasonable search? So, in answer to the, to the SWAT officer, who argues that this is how somehow makes everyone safer. I say, yeah, maybe in a hostage situation, maybe in the case of a barricaded gunman, you're right, that's how you want it done. But not to search search warrants, you want it with dead kids. And there's been many situations where they've gone to the wrong house and then killed the wrong guy, killed someone who's doing nothing at all. One guy turned around with a hair dryer in his hand. You couldn't hear him come in. Turns out the hair dryer in his hand, they shoot him, they think it's a gun. Why does he have to, in his own house, make sure his hands are clear as he walks around in his bathroom? He doesn't. Because he had a hair dryer in his hand, they shot him. That's the problem. That tight time frame, adrenalized, dynamic injury situation where their training is to identify things in people's hands and fire. That's a problem. That works for, for barricaded situations, for hostages. It does not work when the person inside is not someone who's trying to kill other people. Okay? You don't serve a search warrant like that. So this has to stop, and our point being here today, this was a particularly tragic, unnecessary death. And we felt compelled to be here. We had enough. As Sheriff Max said in the one audio we put on line, he's had enough of it. And it's time for us to take a stand. We're going to lose some police officers. We have, you know, quite a few thousands in our organization. Uh, but I don't see anybody else stepping up. I don't see the, you know, the Maternal Order of Chiefs of Police stepping up. I don't see any other police organizations doing this. So I feel like we're, we're compelled to make sure that we do the right thing and let the chips fall more than the bank. So, but anyway, we're here to talk about the policy now. It's the policy that must change. It should start here. As Sheriff Max said earlier at the memorial at the, at the Diana home, we want to make sure that his death is not in vain. This will be the start. It's going to take time, though. It took decades for our police to be turned from peace officers who were there to keep the peace, to, to be turned into just law enforcers. And there's a big, big difference, okay? The primary purpose of government is to secure our rights. And that's what we had the Declaration of Independence read earlier. We had a Marine Sergeant Gonzalez read the Declaration of Independence with, along with her husband. 
And the critical point is that when any government becomes abusive of those ends, it's no longer legitimate. And our government in this country, because of the erosion of our Bill of Rights and the expansion of the concept of government supremacy over the individual citizen, it's flipped upside down in the founders' intent. We're supposed to be sovereign. They turn it upside down. And increasingly, the government's treating us like serfs. They extend the authority and the power to come into our homes when they want to. That's why the Supreme Court of Indiana's decision last week also was so egregious, claiming that you have no right to resist, even if you to use reasonable resistance against unlawful entry by a police officer. So a blatantly unlawful, I'm not even arguing whether it's lawful or not, this is a blatantly unlawful entry. The argument there is that you have no right to resist it. What's that make you? Make sure you assert So we gotta roll this back, and while we do it though, like I said, we're gonna be mindful of the fact that you know, none of us is pure. As I said earlier, all of us who sworn to defend the Constitution, veterans of the military, veterans of the police, we're all responsible for the erosion of our Bill of Rights and for going astray, okay? But we can't just point the blame only at the police officers. It's our responsibility too. So it's our responsibility, likewise, the police officers, the military veterans, the committed citizens, the firefighters, those who do still value the Constitution, we have to work together, not to fight and conquer ourselves, but work together to walk back towards liberty, towards a full strength bill of rights. And if the courts will respect the bill of rights, then we got these political pressure. And so we encourage folks to start with this incident right here. Uh, tomorrow we're gonna go and we're gonna submit our proclamation to the governor, to the attorney general of, of, uh, of Arizona, and also to the Arizona State Legislature. And we're going to call for an independent investigation. That's one thing I want to talk about for Rick Sheriff Matt Gutter. Whenever you have a district attorney investigating the, uh, a shooting, what you have there is a conflict of interest. He is the county attorney. He's the attorney for the county in civil suits. When the Arizona family sues uh, Pima County, and the Pima County uh, Sheriff's Department, it's going to be the county attorney. It's going to be on the other side defending those actions. How could you ever expect any kind of independent review of the behavior of the police department from a criminal standpoint from the same man who's going to defend them in a civil case? It, it is, you know, even as pure or as, as uh, honest and full of integrity as any individual is, what do the founders tell us? Let's hear no more of trust in men, but bind them down to the change of the Constitution. And it meant range of no need of government, as Madison said in those papers. You have to have divided power. That's why you have division of power. You can't have the county investigating the county and the department of the county and expect an independent review of what happened. So that's why you need to have someone at the state level, the AG preferably, but someone at the state level that has to do an independent investigation into the shooting. That should be done with every shooting. Now, I believe the Sheriff Mack does in the, in the uh, privacy of the Sheriff is in his duties to uphold and defend the Constitution. But when you have a Sheriff who is trampling on the Fourth Amendment and violating the rights of the citizens under the state Constitution, the other old sworn officers in the state have an obligation and a duty to correct that. They need to investigate. And if he is breaking his oath and violating his oath, he has no authority to act outside of his, of his limited duties under the Constitution. Right, Sheriff Mack? So we will call for an independent investigation, and across this country, we're going to encourage people first to approach their sheriff and say, Sheriff, here, here's our proclamation about this incident in Arizona. We want a written commitment from you, a promise that you will not do this in this community. Put him on the spot. Get it in writing. If he won't do that, this will be a litmus test for you when it comes to the next election. If he won't respect your home, you're supposed to be secure in your papers, homes, and effects. How secure do you feel if you know that the police are claiming the authority and the power and the right to mimic a home invasion? That's what it really turns out to be. They're saying that, hey, we don't care what you want. We reserve the right to kick in your door, just like a criminal home invasion gang would do. And while you're trying to figure out who it is, if you dare keep the bare arms and dare to arm yourself in defense of your family against what you perceive as a home invader, then we are going to shoot you. That's what they're really telling you. They tell you they're going to use SWAT teams in this manner. I know that might tick off some police officers when we talk about that, but you tell me what else it says. So you should insist that SWAT teams are used for the rarest of circumstances and not used on a low threshold. Here's another big problem. 
is that when, when asked about the criteria that's used for the use of SWAT teams like this, the spokesman, Lieutenant I think it was O'Connor, correct, of the of the of the McKenna Sheriff's Department, when asked what criteria triggers a SWAT raid, he said, Well, narcotics investigation, uh, a long history of criminal violence, or number three was that the suspect may be armed. So now they're, they're trying to they're starting to elevate your gun ownership as being as serious a reason, as valid a reason for triggering the use of a SWAT raid as if you had a long rap sheet of criminal violence. So that should be a wake up call for the gun owner in this country. That's another big point I want to make is that far too many conservatives out there have separated out parts of the Bill of Rights. They pay too much attention to only the Second Amendment, not as much as the Fourth or the First or the Fifth or the Sixth. They are all there for a reason. Do you think our founders are fools? They were not. They have learned from history. They all interrelate. So, um, Sheriff Mack is going to come up, and as I said before, I'll let him directly address uh, Sheriff Dunick, one sheriff to another. Sheriff Mack was a sheriff in Graham County, Arizona, and he's been in law enforcement for, as a peace officer, should I say. He served 25 years as a peace officer in one capacity or another in Utah and Arizona. And he is famous for going up against the Clinton administration in the Brady Gun Bill case. And he was um, also, uh, in fact, I think he has something to say about Judge, Judge Roll as well, uh, who he considers to be a, a model, you know, model of a constitutionalist judge. So, Sheriff Mack, please come up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chair